Good morning. This is Maria Aglope from SK Ghost Associates, and I would like to welcome all of you to our today's web seminar on post-tension concrete principles and practice. One of our speakers today is Mr. Dirk Bundy, who's been a practicing engineer since 1989 and is the president of Seneca Structural Engineering, Inc., a firm that specializes in the design of post-tension concrete. In addition to his structural design experience, Mr. Bundy currently teaches pre-stress concrete design at the UCLA and at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. He is co-author of the book Post-Tension Concrete Principles and Practice and has published in numerous journals and conference proceedings. He is registered civil and structural engineer in the states of California, Nevada, Hawaii, and Arizona. Our other speaker today is Mr. Brian Allred. He is a licensed structural engineer who is specialized in design of reinforced concrete buildings utilizing post-tension floor systems. He is the co-author of the book Post-Tension Concrete Principles and Practice, which covers the design of post-tension concrete structures from basic fundamentals to specific construction detailing. Brian is a fellow of the Post-Tension Institute, PTI, a member of the Building Design Committee, and has given numerous PTI educational seminars across the country, highlighting the use and benefits of post-tensioning. Before I hand the microphone over to our speakers, I would like to mention a few brief things for those of you who may not have attended one of our web seminars before. We divide each web seminar into three segments. The first two segments will consist of 25 to 30 minutes of presentation, followed by a five-minute break and 10-minute question and answer session. In the third segment, we will skip the break and go directly from a 25-minute presentation to the last 10-minute Q&A session. You can type in your questions at any time in the Q&A box to the right of the slide, and the questions will be addressed by the speaker during the next question and answer session when you will be able to see the questions submitted by other participants in the notes box above the Q&A area. Also, I apologize for the miscommunication over the instruction email everyone received yesterday. I want everyone to know that there are no handouts or certification for this specific web seminar. With that, Dirk Bundy and Brian Aldrich, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Maria. And welcome to our shameless promotion of post-tension concrete principles and practice and uh, PT data. I will be uh, your host for, uh, my name is Dirk Bondi, I will be your host for the book portion. And Brian, I'll hand that off and he's going to dazzle you with PT data input and output. Uh, my father really should have written this book. We waited, everybody waited. He never wrote a book, so... We got bored during the uh, recession and decided we needed to do something to keep us busy. So we wrote this book. Um, I asked my father, Ken Bondi, to write the first chapter, The History of Post-Tension Concrete in the United States. There's nobody more appropriate or al alive, more appropriate, uh, to have written that chapter. Brian and I continued to write the rest of the book. And, uh, and I showed it to my dad, and he, he went over it, and um, somewhere in the discussion of his opinion of the book, he used the word hillbilly, I think, jokingly, of course, but uh, this is not a traditional textbook, and it's not written in a way that uh, you're probably used to, to seeing. I think the nice way of putting it is it's a more colloquial style than a traditional textbook, but we wanted to have fun doing it. Uh, we didn't know if five total people in the world would ever read a book about post-tension concrete and certainly the text that we put in there. So we thought at least we'd have a good time doing it. Okay, so I'm going to do my best to tell myself not to go down any rabbit holes and not to get caught up in anything or I will never finish. I'm trying to shoot for about an hour and uh, I am easily distracted, those of you who know me, and I start talking about something, but I'm going to do my best not to do that. Chapter one, I want to hit the highlights. Chapter one is the chapter written by my father. Um, it's very entertaining. He, like I said, is by far the best person to write this chapter, and it is entertaining. I'll let you read it. I do want to point out a couple things. This is the early calculator. <laughs> he shows the early computer. 
what's kind of funny is this this is really two generations ago because when I speak when I teach at UCLA or Cal Poly I talk about something called DOS and get a bunch of puzzled looks um, I tell them there was something called C colon backslant and a flashing cursor where I had to tell the computer what to do and they look at me like I'm some crazy old dinosaur maybe I am but um, so so this is definitely two generations ago I'm one generation of old as far as the, uh, the students are concerned when I took I took pre-stress concrete at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo loved the school I also again at Berkeley loved that too but I was not happy with the way the class was presented. I, I'll be honest, I'm honest with all the students that I have. Uh, they told, both classes said that the equivalent load method was something that uh, T.Y. Lin had come up with that was effectively irrelevant now that computers had were mainstream and spreadsheets were around and that we really wouldn't need equivalent loads anymore. So neither class that I took focused on that, kind of mentioned it towards the end. Really, they couldn't have been more incorrect. Um, the only way, in my opinion, to really understand pre-stressed concrete is the equivalent load method. T.Y. Lin was right in the 60s and the 70s, he was right in the 80s, and he's right today. So it's the first thing that I present to the students. Um, I spend the first two hour lecture explaining that a weightless beam simply supported with absolutely no loads on it can have stresses, will have stresses, will have deflection, will not have reactions. <laughs> and uh, the fact that we spend two hours discussing a simply supported weightless beam with no loads on it can be confusing and they end up leaving kind of scratching their heads, but, but intrigued. In 2011, I taught the first class out at UCLA, and I had no idea at the time that I was being hired to teach the last class at UCLA, the last time UCLA would teach pre-stressed concrete regularly. Schools across the country are dropping the course. According to PTI, there's less than 20 schools that actually teach pre-stressed concrete, a, a course dedicated entirely to pre-stressed concrete. I teach two of them. I teach one at UCLA and, and one at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Um, but in 2011, I dove right in and started do, talking about indeterminate beams and doing examples, and the students looked at me like deer in the headlights. Uh, they, not one of the 19 students that I had, and I had about a third graduate students and, and two-thirds seniors, uh, could analyze an indeterminate beam. They could only analyze statically determinate, simply supported elements. So I learned that on a Tuesday. On a Wednesday, I scrambled, created notes for moment distribution, and gave them a method to do it, and we went on from there. But um, the school system's changed since the 80s when I was in it. They're on to more exciting and sexy things, I think, and unfortunately, some of the basics are being cut out uh, when something's got to go, and I, I'm pretty vocal about being disappointed about that. By the way, UCLA now does integrate that into their undergraduate programs, and it's not because I asked them to. I didn't say a thing, but students are funny. When they, when they learn that there was something they should have known and they weren't taught that, they get very vocal. And UCLA is a good school. They listened, and now they do come to me with, um, with a knowledge of moment distribution. But I will tell you that I can strike fear in the hearts of any student by adding a cantilever. <laughs> and initial panic, usually, but I explained to them that cantilevers are great for cast and place concrete. They come for free. They come for free, no premium in pre stress concrete. In fact, if we move that column back, the architect's happy, the backspan is decreased, the positive moment in the backspan is decreased, the deflections are decreased. So. I integrate uh, cantilevers into midterms, homework assignments, and, and by the time they leave my class, they're, they're pretty good with cantilevers. We jump right into 
indeterminate systems and stresses in indeterminate systems. When I took the class, uh, I, it was the last or second to last week before we were even aware that pre-stressed concrete was used in multi-span systems. That is not the way to teach it. That's not the way to learn it. Um, so much of what's exciting about pre-stressed concrete can't be taught with a statically determinate member. So they get moment distribution. We go right into indeterminate systems. And they start learning pre-stressed concrete. This is effectively a homework assignment that I give. It's the third homework assignment that I give every single uh, time that I teach this. Uh, and it's, this is fun. This is my favorite homework assignment. This is the one that really hooks them. I give them a two-span beam, and there's always a short span, always a long span. Never the same problem, never the same loading, never the same beam sections, but always the same idea. I fully drape their first problem, the first part of the homework is fully draped in both bays, which is what people do who don't really understand pre-stressed concrete. They fully drape everything. We see it all the time. And they set it up so that it does not work. The stresses are exceeded. The tensile stresses in the bottom of the longer span are exceeded. Then I have them do something to fix it. I have them raise the drape from four inches to, in this particular example, they raise the drape to 12 inches. They redo the whole thing, and lo and behold, the stresses that didn't work previously now work. And I have them really focus on what just happened. Why did that happen? Then I do another thing. I, I tell them to fully drape both bays again, but instead of using 12 tendons in both bays, they drop off four tendons and only use eight in this particular example. I change it each time, but they decrease the number of tendons. They actually save money. They reduce something. They don't add anything to something that didn't work. And lo and behold, again, the whole system works. All the stresses now work. That usually hooks them into this exciting concept of load balancing. It's really stress balancing that we're doing. Okay. Moving on. Our book in this, I think our book is very different than anybody else's book. And I say that without having ever purchased really anybody else's book <laughs> other than uh, T.Y. Lin's book. So I'm, I am kind of guessing at that. But in the flexural design portion, our book is probably very similar to everybody else's book. Uh, basically, a, a stress strain curve for pre-stressed steel that I think we've all seen that isn't linear elastic, linear inelastic. It's, um, it has a funny curve to it. So that part, not much different. But the exciting part is actually calculating the demand. And the demand in post-tension concrete is affected by secondary moments, secondary reactions. And that's where it gets exciting. Not, not determining the capacity. You really just have one more tensile force based on an FPS value and follow the code and calculate the capacity, just really like a rebar beam. But understanding the secondary effects is, is where it gets exciting. And, and my students understand that. They won't leave my class without a full understanding of secondary effects and calculating demand moments. They understand that the demand moment in post-tension concrete is 1.2 times the dead load moment plus 1.6 times the live load moment plus 1.0 times the secondary moment. They leave my class understanding that they have a factored load moment diagram, 1.2 dead, 1.6 live, added to a secondary moment diagram to get a final demand moment. And that's, that's where flexure is exciting in post-tension concrete. Beam shear design. I used to um, try to act like I was a supporter of the ACI shear method, the equations, uh, tried to pretend that it made sense and, and tell the students that this is really good, valuable stuff that they were learning. Students are too smart for that. 
my father and I have an article that's coming out, I believe, next month, the September, October Concrete International Journal uh, magazine. And it really, we just explain how poor the ACI shear design of beams is. And I, I changed my method of teaching. I now tell the students this is really a poor methodology. I, it, I have no idea how it's lasted so long in the ACI code without being changed. Um, it's difficult. It's confusing. There's nothing intuitive about it. Uh, it's the pre-stressed concrete is the only material that I'm aware of that every foot that you move through the span, you have to recalculate the capacity of the material in shear. Um, that's no fun. But one thing about students is, is if you tell it, if you're honest with them and you say you're going to hate this and the goal is for you to hate this as much as I do, you're still going to know more about this than anybody else, but it's not going to be fun. I give them a homework assignment. Like I said, I change everything each year, but the, but the guts of it is always the same. All I have to do to show them that their results don't make sense, but let me back up. All of the testing was done on precast, simply supported beams for shear. So to show students or anybody else that all the answers start going awry quickly, all you have to do is create a negative moment and an inflection point. So I can still do a statically determinate beam. It will now have an inflection point. Uh, it's got a negative moment. And really, you will see or they will see that none of these equations really make any sense. It's a tremendous amount of work for them. But when they're done, they're still left with something they should have absolutely no confidence in. This is typical of the results that they will get. Where we know, where every test program has ever shown the failure in shear right at the support at a 45 degree angle, this particular example only requires number threes at 24. But 10 feet away from the support, the ACI code equations require a number three, number three stirrups at 11.8 inches, two legs. Same thing over here. Number three is at 19 at this support, but 15 feet away, you need, in this design, number three bars at 12 inches on center. There is no intuitive way to know where in the beam <laughs> the, the controlling stirrup design is. You have to literally walk through and use a computer and and hit every foot. That just, that's just terrible. Most of the time, if you're going to do a lot of calculations, at least the answers should be great answers that you have all kinds of faith in. But that is just not the case here. And my students leave my class disliking Shear as much as I do. And we, we're not just trying to be critis, critics, my father and I. We have promoted another methodology which is much more rational, much more sane. And I don't think, I know ACI is working on it too, but I don't think anything's going to really solve the problem until for each span, the concrete contribution to the shear capacity is constant. It can't change foot to foot based on the drape of the tendons. That really doesn't make sense, but I'm, I'm going down one of those rabbit holes. Back out of the rabbit hole. I don't cover this in the classes that I teach, but we have an extensive section in shear on, on punching shear. Most of the work that Brian and I do are flat plates, so we needed to get really good at this. This is the traditional method but um, of calculating punching shear, but what we wanted to do, stud rails, shear studs, are integral with post-tension concrete now. They, you really, we almost never do a flat plate that doesn't include shear studs. If we're doing a podium, we'll use uh, caps, but for any of the thinner decks with the lighter loads, we will always use shear studs. So we wanted to really understand it. We didn't, we were using proprietary uh, software, but the proprietary software always points you in the direction of only using their product. And we really wanted to write our own uh, program, which we did, that would design the, the shear studs also. So we put the examples in the book. We have an example of an interior uh, stud rail design. We match PT data in the, uh, in the stresses. 
then we go on to the design of the rails themselves. Uh, I had to accumulate about four different documents because in my opinion, everybody who's written a document on shear studs purposely left large gaps in the logic. You, you had to make great leaps of faith to get from one point to another. And I, you know, the conspiracy theorist in me believes that they were doing that on purpose, that none of these uh, suppliers really wanted you to be able to do this yourself. <laughs> so I got a hold of the ACI, I think it was the 421, and and to be honest with you, that wasn't very clear either. But but putting this all together, the puzzle finally was put together, and, and we wrote our own program. We give that away for free, by the way. Uh, anybody who buys our book is free to send us an email, and we'll send you a copy of this software program. Well, we used it, and we went back to all the proprietary software and, and put in various examples and always got the same answer. So I think we were on the right track. We have an interior and, a, um, and an edge situation. So. This is this this chapter, chapter seven, a two-span design example, is really an A to Z hand design of a two-span beam. And the purpose for this is this is what my students, UCLA and Cal Poly, leave my class knowing how to do. And for those of you um, who are in a situation to hire, you know, like I said, Brian and I make our money like you guys do. We're we're designing buildings. We're not really trying to make money selling books. This was something more fun for us. But I am serious about uh, about my students being hired, and I want you to know that they can do what I'm about to show you. I am going to flip through each page of, of what they, they can do. All of the homework assignments are bits and pieces of this, and then we wrap back around, and they do a real design example from, from scratch. I have them produce the loading criteria. Now, I've had as many as 58 students in my class, so I can't grade 58 different designs. But So we all do the same design. We come up with it in class. But I do have them as part of the project show me that if I didn't give them the force and profile, and I gave them some direction, like balance 80% of the concrete dead load and give me at least 250 PSI compression, with that limited amount of information, they could come up with a very reasonable force and profile, and they, they eat it up. They get it. I just integrated, um, I used to, let me back up. I used to always give them, because there's a rigid zone in, in a frame, the traditional carryover factor is not 0.5, the rotational stiffness is not 4EI over L, the fixed end moments are not WL squared over 12. They're all something different. And each year up until this year, I had just given them those numbers so that they could work their way into a moment distribution and, and match PT data at the face of column with all their calculations. But UCLA, I'm constantly being accused of making the class too easy and uh, they tell me to make it more difficult, make the grading uh, not as good. So I keep trying to integrate something more complicated, but the students just eat it up. They just always, everything I throw at them, they can, they love, they do well. Uh, this year I actually had them calculate using moment area, all the rotational stiffness, carryover factors, um, fixed end moments. One of the things my little secret for teaching is, and it makes life easy for me, and it, uh, I think it helps the students, I like to give them the answers. I like to give, I give them all the PT data output for their project, so they know what the right answer is, and I give them this table when I do this, so they know what they need, where they need to go, and they're frustrated if they don't get there, and I'm there to help them. But it's much better <laughs> from a teaching perspective to have the students find their own mistakes and fix it. So that when they finally turn in the homework or the project, they've got most of it perfect. And uh, I think they'd rather learn that way, too. So they will come up with the frame stiffness, the distribution factors. They go right into the dead loads from their loading criteria and come up with dead load shears. Dead load moments, reduce those moments to the face of the column, 
check those against the computer output. Do the same with the live loads. They calculate the equivalent loads based on the force and profile that we come up with. They do a moment distribution, get the shears and moments at the face of column again. Check them. My students know which moments to are uh, superpositioned to calculate stresses. I give them an example. I do this example for them on the board. It takes about two or three lectures to get through. Um, they have to do everything. They have to calculate stresses at every face of column and at the uh, spans. But they can do it. And they check all of those numbers against computer output. And my students know that that fixes the force and profile. When I took these classes at Cal Poly and at Berkeley, I really had no idea what you change to make something work. Um, my students know that that force and profile is now set. Once those service stresses are shown to work, nothing will ever happen from this point forward that will ever change that drape or ever change those forces in those tendons. Those are now set. Everything from that point forward is done with mild reinforcement. Uh, they go on to the, flex the strength calculations, flexural strength, shear strength. They will calculate a secondary moment diagram, check that with the computer output. I have them show me statics. I want to know that they understand that even though stressing has occurred and secondary reactions have occurred, that they net sum to zero. There are no net vertical loads. We didn't add any weight to the system, so there can't be any net vertical loads. There can't be any net moments on the system. So hopefully they leave my class understanding that too. They will calculate the demand moment at the face of every column and in the span. I, um, I think I'm a relatively nice guy when I do this. I try to set it up so that if they understand what the minimum bonded reinforcement is at every location and start with that amount of mild steel, that when they do the flexural calculations, it will work. Every once in a while, I make that not work, and they have to add one more bar. But usually, they calculate the minimum bonded steel. They've got a force and profile. They do flexural stress, um, fl uh, flexural capacity calculations, and it usually works. Go on into shear design. I give them a really arduous six homework assignment where they learn to hate shear as much as I do. Uh, so I really take my foot off the gas on the project. I only require that they use the VCN equation, which is pretty easy to use. And they've calculated all these values already somewhere in the project. So it's not difficult for them. They will design the stirrups. Uh, I say it's an A to Z, but it's really not. It's more like an A to Y, because I don't have them calculate deflections. But I try to make sure they leave my class understanding that Post-tension concrete eliminates deflections from being the controlling part of the design. You know, in this case, you only want to calculate so many times L over 9,000, L over 6,500, before you realize that you really don't need to do that. One of the criticisms of our book is that we don't spend really any time on deflections, and that's my rationale. In, in 25 years of doing this, I've never once had a design, one-way slab, two-way slab, uh, beam design controlled by deflections. And that's because, <laughs> I mean, post tension concrete, concrete wouldn't be nearly as popular as it is if it wasn't eliminating that as an issue. They will do a much better looking design drawing than this, but they will do a full blown drawing prepared um, with the intent of giving it to a draftsman, and they have to show me everything they've done. But every student that, that leaves my class will have done this. And for those of you, in a hiring position, please hire them, put them on your post tension concrete. They are ready to go. Um, I'm really not going to spend much time on one way slabs because, as I tell my students, if you just went through the beam design, one way slabs are the same thing, but just easier. You don't design shear stirrups. Uh, we don't really check shear at all. And um, the only thing that's semi-interesting in our example, I'll be honest with you, is, is how to handle numerically the pore strip. So
we get into two-way slab design examples and uh, like I said this is mostly the work that Brian and I do I've got long examples in them but the one I want to just point out to you is the one I'm most proud of is the second example that got into the third edition of the book it is a to Y, <laughs> not quite A to Z because we don't calculate deflections either in this, but it's every single hand calculation from beginning to end on a flat plate design. I will probably never teach an advanced course in pre-stressed concrete or you know a, a pre-stressed concrete two, but if I did, this would be the end product. This would be what I want the students to get to, just like in in the first pre-stressed concrete class where they learned all the bits and parts and then did a complete hand calculation of a two-span beam, I would do the same thing here. I would have them do all the, in the homework assignments, the bits and pieces of, of equivalent frame design, flat plate design, punching shear, and then put it all together in a, in a design project. I hope somebody takes this and runs with it and does that someday. I hope post-tension concrete someday becomes popular enough to have an advanced course. Right now, we're struggling just to make sure that there's any courses out there on pre-stressed concrete, and, and I'm not kidding either. Um, in this, they will do the same type of calculations that they did with the beam design, but it'll include equivalent frame properties, uh, torsional members, all the things that go into the equivalent frame. And then they will go on and do all the same things they did before with dead and live load, and figure out demand moments, secondary moments. But what's different, of course, is that they have punching shear to deal with now and to really understand. You can integrate shear stud design into it if you want to. But um, minimum bonded top and bottom rebar is also included. And that's often not well understood from my experience. At the top, minimum bonded reinforcement is not that hard to do. Most people don't realize that it's always the same in both directions. It's not single directional. You actually have to calculate what you need in both directions and then use it, the worst case, in both directions. The minimum bonded steel on the bottom of a flat plate is kind of a complicated thing to do. You just need to accumulate a lot of numbers to do it, but I've in this example, I've shown how that's done. I'm not going to go through it here, but it's in there. This is a long example. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in it. I'm not going to go through most of it, but there are a few things I want to show you that I don't think are going to be in anybody else's book. I don't know for sure, but I... I'm going to suspect that most people aren't going to show you their planter detail. The thing about the planter detail is that the landscape engineer is usually designing right up until the day before the pour. Um, the planters are moving around. Honestly, they, it's a schematic design until we're about four levels up. So you really have to build in some flexibility. And we found that this particular uh, detail, it's a self-contained box that doesn't require that the steel go down to the deck. This is kind of saved us over and over. We're huge fans of geofoam. I will be showing you various uses of geofoam in these examples. By the way, at this point in the book, we, we've left the, the academic part, the university part. We're now into the practicing engineer part. One of the things I do want to point out, if you're going to do podium designs, you're going to have to address the fact that there's a step in the system at the building line. Over here is are the buildings. Out here, uh, landscape, courtyard, plaza. One way or the other, early in the design, you're going to have to decide if that step is built integral with the structural post-tension deck or if you're going to use a topping slab. There are times when each one is appropriate, and that's something that we talk a lot about in the example. But there are some things to look out for. If you build this as a structural step, there are some things that can go wrong. First thing, the contractor will almost always ask you to square this off. They don't want you doing 
what we show, and we say no every single time. That's because the post-tensioning supplier is going to supply chairs that are based off the bottom of the deck effectively being flat or having mild slopes to it. The, the drape is all the same if you have a mild slope, if you have a ramp in a parking structure. None of that is affected. But if all of a sudden you change the depth of the concrete dramatically at a single location, and those chairs are used and placed down off the bottom, you very likely have a situation where you've created a, a significant upward load, upward balance load. And you could be in a situation where you've created this problem. So that is something to look out for. Now, the foolproof solution, the one that we use whenever we've got a big undulating deck, a deck that's going in and out, maybe has bay windows, uh, that step, I'm sorry, a step that is meandering all over the place, at that point, we really try to push for a topping slab. All of those problems of potential blowouts go away and overbalancing. The forms couldn't be easier. I'm going to back up and make everybody dizzy, but in this particular picture, this form has to be hovering. It is floating. It has got to have its own support system. That's very difficult for a contractor to do, you know, the, the hanging form. Nothing easier than plopping up a two by six form and creating an edge. That concrete, you know, the bean counters in the beginning of the project will never want you to do this. They, they are doing material takeoffs and in their method, in their way of looking at things, this is always an expense and never a benefit because they're only looking at material. But they're not the ones who get so frustrated and call you out to the job site when the city has to come down, the, shop, the, the job is shut down because no one's sure if the post-tensioning drape through all of these steps is correct. And they'll look at you and it'll be your job to decide that. And you say, hey, I wanted a topping slab. There are benefits to the topping slab other than just being simple. There are always bathroom tub traps. There are toilet castings. Those things are a pain when they have to recess down into the structural deck. A topping slab eliminates that from being a problem. Um, again, the forming is extremely easy. Those anchor bolts are almost never perfect. They're bent. They're a little off place. You actually have a five and a half inch depth to realign them, hammer them over, kick them over, whatever you need to do. But one of the biggest problems that, or really solutions that the topping slab offers is w when a deck below is not flat and it's angling and it's stepping and it's going up and down, the poor mason is supposed to cut those walls to those angles. They never will. It's, it's much too difficult to ask for somebody to do that. So what we end up finding is that the masonry walls are just built higher than they're supposed to be. So all of the pipe insulation that we've put in for slip connections and plastic, and that's all going to get cut out when the wall gets cut back down. So one of the big reasons to consider a topping slab is the masonry walls. Are the masonry walls below that are really need to kind of be at the right place and meet up? Another benefit is, you know, I'm going to show you pictures. We can't stand conduit. That's the <laughs> closest thing we ever have to a real fight out at a job site. But that allows five and a half inches. You can use one and a half, two inch conduit even. Just lay it on the deck and pour over the topping slab. The topping slab's cheap. It's, it's 3,000 PSI concrete, lightly reinforced, like a slab on ground. It's not an expensive piece of concrete. And even sometimes in colder areas, we've put floor heating units, elements in there. Brian and I are, I think, two of the only people that I'm aware of whose podium structure uh, has been completely torched during construction at the worst possible time during construction. When this happened, we had five, four or five levels of wood, four levels plus a loft framing, wood framing only up above. All the drywall that was going to be placed on that was down below on pallets. Um, and I, I'm assuming that some of the local residents didn't appreciate the architecture. It was too modern for them. So they came and poured gasoline all over the building up above one night and torched the whole thing. We had a five-story 
bonfire on top of our structure. And the debris falling from that structure came down the stair shafts, the elevator shafts that didn't have anything in them off the sides and ignited everything below. This truck suffered, its wheels melted, everything suffered. But everything I thought I knew about fire changed after this. I, I think I had everything just about backwards. First of all, you know, there's a lot of discussion about silicus aggregate being being bad and needing 20% more cover, carbonate aggregate being good, restrained versus unrestrained bays, are, are all exterior bays, unrestrained bays. There's debates that go on and on and on. Um, but they're almost entirely based upon the fire attacking the building from the bottom. And we're really talking about modifying covers in the end or unrestrained bays. In our job, in this job, the whole the hot fire was on top. We had a five-story bonfire on the top of our, our building. And we only have one inch cover at the top. And nobody ever really concerns themselves with the top uh, fire cover. It's, it's always that bottom. But with one inch of cover, this thing did extremely well. Uh, they, there were pock marks, as you can see. The cover concrete got, got damaged somewhat, but the post-tension deck was the only thing left. Everybody else's trade was gone. It was ashes. The only thing left standing was, was our building. Um, we know that compressing concrete is pretty much in, it always uh, increases benefits the, the properties of concrete. Every property of concrete is improved with about 150 to, to 175 PSI of compression. We know that the water tightness increases. That's been known. Durability, if you're in an aggressive environment, is increased by pre-stressing concrete and squeezing it. The one that not everybody may know is just the plain flexural strength of the concrete itself is increased. And, and I've learned that from PTI presentations where they wanted to demolish eight 10, 12 story buildings that were post tension concrete. They shored them. They used a saw and saw cut all of the post tensioning. So there was no reinforcement really in these buildings. And these were designed back when that was the only reinforcing in there. No compression anymore. They pulled all the forms expecting the building to fall down and it just stood there. The only rationale that anybody could come up with was that the concrete was hydrating and curing under compression and that dramatically increases its plain concrete flexural capacity. So we know that the shear capacity of concrete is increased. As much as I can't stand the shear equations, they still always show that, that pre-stressing concrete increases the shear capacity, the aggregate interlock. To that long list of properties that are benefited by compressing concrete, we must add fire resistance. I am absolutely convinced that the main reason that this structure continued standing was it was post-tension. That compression would not allow that fire in. Just like it won't allow water in, just like it doesn't allow uh, an aggressive environment and salts in, except for the top and the sides. Uh, it didn't want to let that fire in either. Now, this is where it kind of got interesting. Um, even though our part of the building was the only thing that was standing, uh, Brian and I were the only ones fired from the project when it was all done. <laughs> and I'm not really kidding. I'm not kidding at all. Uh, they wanted us to say that this deck was fine. It was standing and that it, they could con con ah, continue construction. We said, fine, we'll, we'll write a letter, uh, but we want you to test visually every grout pocket. We want destructive testing. We want material testing. We want the concrete to be cored. We wanted to see what had happened, how brittle had it become because of this fire. We wanted post-tensioning tendons taken out and tested, rebar. And most importantly, we wanted a load test. Uh, they decided that we were scared little old ladies. And if there's any little old ladies out there, I mean, no offense whatsoever. I, some of my favorite people 
in the world, including my own mom, is a little old lady. So I great affection for little old ladies. But that's who they thought we were on this. They wanted to hire somebody a little bit more morally relaxed, I guess, with respect to death and stuff like that. No, I really don't know exactly what happened. I know we were not involved and somebody else got involved. I don't know what testing was done. Um, we wanted load testing with sandbags. We wanted that whole thing loaded up with sandbags. And they chose to load test it by building a building and putting live people in. So you know, six one way, half dozen the other, I guess. But the main thing to take away from this is post-tensioning, I think, improves everything about concrete. This is another long example. If you have the book, you can go through it. I am just going to hit on a few things and tell you little stories. We are huge fans of geofoam, as I said before. This is the ramp. This is a parking structure, a uh, post tension mat foundation, of course. And we learned to do this after we learned by failing. You know, at Cal Poly, they learn by doing. Brian and I have learned by failing sometimes. But uh, we did one of our first, probably our very first mat design, post-tension mat design, and we allowed the contractor to pile all the soil on the ramp, and, and that ramp was in one corner of the building. Uh, we showed this to the geotechnical engineer. The geotechnical engineer had to sign and stamp our drawings. We made it clear this is what we were doing. They said all the deflection estimates in the soils report would remain the same. And what really happened was that corner of the parking structure sunk uh, about three inches where you know, we had piled about a thousand or more pounds per square foot of soil in a corner of the building to create this ramp. And the building just tilted. It just rotated. Fascinating thing was that in that rotation, nobody noticed. Nobody noticed that that had happened until they came to build the building next to it and then found out that the stairs weren't meeting up by three inches. Then they shot the building and it was in a rotated state. But the building was wrapped in, in masonry and there was not one masonry crack. There was not one slab crack. <laughs> there was not any distress in that structure whatsoever due to a very significant rotation. So it was a failure in some ways, but boy, was it a great example of how great a post-tension mat foundation can be. So we use geofoam now. We will not budge on that. couple things you know we used to use PT data as just just as if it were a podium and it was upside down podium and uh, there are a few th things you got to be careful about if you're using a program that's designed for podiums and you're using it as a mat foundation when you put in a cap it's actually on the wrong side in the program so you will not get that full cap dimension available for punching shear so that's something to uh, to think about um, another thing is that we keep the mat as thin as we possibly can. We use what look like um, spread footings. They're really just caps designed for punching shear, and, and we drop the ah. – sorry about this. We drop the flexural reinforcement down into the cap and we extend the cap so that it's long enough for the minimum length required of that rebar. That gets it out of the way of the post tensioning. It increases the D for negative moments. But the thing to remember with mats is that any mat, post tension or not, is going to effectively eliminate differential settlement between columns and, and walls, supports. But the mat itself increases the total settlement. And I have been told by geotechnical engineers that, no, that's not the case. Well, you're, you're taking away 120 pounds per cubic foot of soil, and you're putting back 150. So it's almost a net zero. That is just simply not the case. And again, we've kind of learned by failing uh, on that. The grading will grade, the grader will grade that site right to where it needs to be. The, the um, 
problem with the analysis of, of swapping out one for the other is that assumes a rebound of the, f- the spring capacity of the soil. But that's not the case. The, the grader is going to grade right to the grade that it needs to be. And when you go and you put three or four feet of concrete on that, based on the spring properties of the soil, that will sink under the full weight of that concrete. And like I said, we we now no longer listen to the geotech when they tell us that. We want the, the solid mat thickness to be as thin as possible, and then we locally put a, a, a cap in for punching shear and, and to put the flexural steel in. And we, we've had great success doing that. Um, you know, at first, they don't want to do that. They say, oh, we want a solid thickness. But we say, if, if this were a, a spread footing job and you had a floating slab, how would you, would you complain? No, you'd dig spread footings and you'd have a solid thickness floating slab. So this is really very similar, except the, the spread footing is a little wider and shallower and the, the constant thickness slab is a little thicker. But once it's explained that way, everybody's good to go. We always use a waste slab. They always try to get us to take it out, and we always force them. They call it rat slab, waste slab, um, slurry slab. But I will tell you, a, a mat, post-tension mat, is going to have about three or four times as much post-tensioning in it than an elevated deck. And um, you would never uh, shore or um, brace the post-tensioning tendons off of supports that weren't stable. And if you put these chairs down in the dirt, the dirt will become mud and you will not be able to maintain the, the profile that you want. So we always insist on a little cheap slurry slab down below. Next chapter. Believe it or not, we put this in because I just wasn't aware of any book, any publication by ACI or anything that had a complete post-tension diaphragm example. And I, I just did what we had been taught. I didn't, there's no original thinking in this. I, I just did simply what I've been taught by a whole bunch of people older and wiser than I am. And when this hit the market, this became a very controversial example, and it remains so. Uh, to this day. ACI has been silent on diaphragms. They've had light mentions of, you know, design your diaphragm correctly and words of wisdom like that. They now want to get into the diaphragm game, but I think everybody who's involved in that has bought Don Breyer's Design of Wood book, which is the greatest book ever for wood design. I loved it. It got me through the structural exam. But it's great for wood, not great for post-tension concrete and post-tension concrete diaphragms, particularly flat plates. They are not the same thing. And I'm just running into all kinds of trouble with people who don't see it that way. Maybe went a little bit overboard. I actually developed the forces using modal analysis and response spectrum, largely because most students leave the class thinking that that's a very complicated thing. And in reality, it's not. The only difficult thing is letting and the computer come up with the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. But once that's done, uh, dynamic analysis can be done by hand. But I'll move on. One of the battles that I'm in is that we move the force left and right, 5% of the building dimension, in the overall seismic design. But I have an hour and 45 minute YouTube video out there going through just this chapter and explaining why you can't put an accidental torsion movement on the center of mass when you're designing the diaphragm. The statics doesn't work anymore. Your resultant force has to align with what your distributed load is. Your shear diagram will close. It won't be correct, but it'll close. And your moment diagram won't close. I could spend hours on this. The one thing I'm noticing in the examples that through my father, he gets sent the examples to look at that ACI is producing and he sends them to me. Um, 
they're statically incorrect a lot of times. They don't account for the fact that there's a perpendicular seismic system that does affect the shear and moment diagrams. It affects the distribution of forces. One of the important things is you need to be consistent in the diaphragm design with what you did in your ETABS design or, or whatever you used, assuming rigid diaphragms. You can't use one type of analysis to get all the earthquake forces to all the seismic members and then change that entirely when you design the diaphragms. And the statics has to work on the diaphragm. Uh, I've seen examples that say, for instance, that they would take the W being 4.08, L squared, L being 150, divided by 8, and come up with a moment like you would in wood or even steel and say, well, that's conservative. But if we all got our calculators and did 4.08 times 150 squared divided by 8, if I recall, that's somewhere about 11,400 something, not even close to what the maximum diaphragm moment actually is. So if you're going to be off by 30 or 40 percent in your demand, you know, you're, you're way off. It really doesn't even matter uh, what you're looking for as far as capacity. <laughs> You're off track. Uh, we will use and show how to use PT data to extract out the amount of post-tensioning that is usable for diaphragm design. The code allows pre-compression due to unbonded tendons to be used for seismic diaphragms. But you've, in our opinion, you, you've got to extract that out, and we show how we do that. Um, this is how I was taught. Now, I said none of this is original for me. I, a very wise older engineer told me that in anything in structural engineering, if you can't draw the failure, then you have no real way of designing against that failure, of understanding it and producing a design that will resist that failure. So these are the shear failure planes, uh, more controversial stuff. <laughs> The most controversial is how we design our drag and collector elements. Um, we look at the failure plane by extending drag elements, rebar, out. We can extend that, increase that failure plane until the capacity of that failure plane is greater than demand. And at that point, we stop. And I, got, I get a lot of criticism about that. What, what the academic world wants to see is, is just like they see in wood or steel, as if this flat plate diaphragm is a series of pieces of beam that need to be strapped together or bolted together, um, and that that distributes out through the entire length and then accumulates load all the way back. And that is just not simply how at least post-tensioners, in my opinion, in my experience, have been doing diaphragm designs, particularly of flat plates, when there are no beams. And all of that is for nothing. If you've designed this plate to be very strong during an earthquake, but you never attached it to the seismic system, all that is for nothing. So we are not shy about burying these dowels down into the shear wall in this case and extending it well out into the diaphragm. So that is definitely not the weak link in one of our designs. I could go on and on, and I think Brian gives lectures for hours on just this chapter, uh, design and detailing for mitigation of restraint to shortening. I am going to show a few things that show up in here. We are, I, the younger me was a big fan of pore strips and keeping them open as long as possible. Um, we always put hours in the mid-span, never at the quarter point. And the reason, hopefully, you can kind of see in this picture, if you use a quarter point pour strip, you are very likely to have the short span raise <laughs> off the forms and the long span stay where it was and create a little ramp. Um, but the older me has just become no fan whatsoever of pore strips at all. We use them when we have to. We now close them up as soon as we can because the only real things that have almost gone wrong on our projects that were serious life threatening situations involved pore strips. Uh, 
Um, I'm, I'm going to actually get to my pore strip little speech in a minute, but we pretty much give it away. We show you the way that we design for uh, slip joints. Someone also very wise told me, probably my dad, that if you don't want it to act like it's connected, don't connect it. That's been good advice. We show you our slip connections, how they work, what they look like in real life world. Uh, you hear a lot that post tensioning can't be done underground. That's not at all true, but you do have to know what you're doing. And again, building a box inside of the outside box is the best way to do it with no connection. You can bring that lower level column in and create a pore strip, an edge pore strip. I'm a fan of those and stress there if you need to. There's a lot of ways to handle it. This is our interior masonry wall to slab connection, exterior masonry wall to slab connection. This is what plastic looks like. We try to use the cheapest materials available at Home Depot to create these slip connections and that's really all you usually need. This is no good when the masons left all the rebar poking up into the slip connection, so we try to point that out. This is important for this note. Um, it's great that you know that you have a slip connection and you've designed the deck to slip relative to the wall. You also need to make sure that the architect and owner are equally aware of that or you'll end up with a situation like this. This is one of our projects in the Disneyland area, a hotel. Uh, I guess we didn't do a really good job of explaining that this was a slip connection. We thought we did and our drawings were clear, but uh, you got to yell and scream that from the mountaintop at the beginning of the project. You'll have some kid out there removing you know, the, <laughs> the stucco just ripped. This was a situation where we were designing the, the box below and another engineer was designing what was coming on top of the podium and had discussions with that engineer, very nice person, had trouble believing and said that to me that this is a plate, it's kind of hard to see, but his plate, he wanted to have bolts coming down into our masonry wall and I said, you can't do that, it, this needs to slip, you need to keep all of your connections within the deck, build up if you need to, but don't go down. Uh, promised me he wasn't going to do this, and then I think he did. <laughs> uh, one of the lessons of pictures like this is, as embarrassing as they are for everybody and humiliating to look at, don't rush in and fix it immediately. Because you'll just be back there fixing it again two weeks later, and then probably two weeks after that. You've got to let it go. You've got to let it come to equilibrium. Stop moving, and at that point, you fix it. Talking about pore strips, our drawing said, that's Brian by the way, our drawing said full reshores required at full length of pore strip, but obviously there's no reshores for, as far as the eye can see in this picture, in one way slabs with 18 foot spans, you're probably always going to be fine. Even if you can't numerically prove that it's okay, it'll be okay. Where this really goes wrong is if this is a 30 foot span or a 32 foot span and this deck is eight or nine inches thick and somebody does this, then you have serious problems. And that's, that has happened on our project. This is something that I think is very important. We really wanted to stress this in the book. Um, I won't spend too much time on it, but reshoring in post-tension concrete in the pore strip bay has been a problem over and over. It's been a problem on our projects. It's been a, we've been called in on, it's been a project, yeah, problem on other people's projects. I am thoroughly convinced that there have been lawsuits, fingers pointed, experts hired, lawsuits settled without ever really understanding what happened. So I'm going to try to explain what I think has gone wrong. The typical reshore rule of thumb is that for a level that can't hold itself up, a freshly poured concrete level, it takes three levels below, rule of thumb, to support, to hold up that level. A third of the load is dropped off at each level. 
Unfortunately, too often that same philosophy by the reshoring contractor is applied in the pore strip bay. And we've had to explain that, no, this, this level can't hold itself up, but neither can this level and neither can this level. This is like a column. The load accumulates as you come down. There is no level that can help you out. So the shoring needs to be increased. And unfortunately, you'll go out and see shoring that looks like this here. And some kid will say, it's the strangest thing. Our, our reshores are bowing. They're actually, and we say, ah, it's buckling. That's oiler buckling. <laughs> um, this has happened on taller buildings. We've been pulled in. Uh, again, these bays can't hold themselves up, so they accumulate load. But unfortunately, the reshore contractors are of the opinion that it only takes three levels to support all of the levels that can't support themselves. And they start decreasing <laughs> the shores, and they start buckling. They do start bowing and buckling at the lower levels. Um, if the rule of thumb is that for every level that can't support itself, you need three others, in this example, there are four open pore strip bays, you would need 12 levels below participating in holding up all that load. One twelfth of the load could get dropped off at each level. I've explained that in meetings when the floors are terribly uneven and nobody can figure out why they're so uneven in the pore strip bay and sagging. And I explain, you needed 12 levels. And they just look at me, you know, deer in the headlight type of stuff. So on our projects, we make sure, if we've got this situation, we tell them, reshore all the way to the ground. Just don't ask any questions. Reshore all the way to the ground. This needs to just pass through those decks and get to the foundation. Don't try to have any deck that's been cured and stressed support any of this. We think the best way now is just get rid of the pore strip. Or if we have to have a pore strip, we close it as soon as we can so we don't end up in a situation of stacked open floors. And if you've got a quarter point port strip, everything I said just got exponentially worse. Um, if you laterally bend your banded cables, you may get away with that for a little while, but you will learn, as we did by failing, that you really should not put any severe bends in post-tensioning. There are good bends. By the way, this is a loop-de-loop -loop that probably would have exploded if either Brian or I didn't catch it. This is a nice mild bend. This is going to be okay, most likely. But you know, we've certainly failed on ours, and we no longer put these severe bends in. Um, you'll note that when the concrete cover is less than it should be, you're almost guaranteed to have this problem. And in these situations, and there are many times in the project that the cover over the tendons will only be a half of an inch, even though you called it out to be an inch. And, You'll know where that happened if you bent those bands. This has kind of become a famous picture. My dad and I argue over which one of us took this picture, but it is a failed deck after North Ridge earthquake. And both of us had the great wisdom to crawl underneath a building that was in about to fail and take these pictures. This is... Um, Post-tensioning slab, you can see a couple post-tensioning tenons going this way and a couple post-tensioning tenons going this way. And that is all that is holding up about a 30 foot by 30 foot bay with apartments on top of it. This is like one of those things where you, you read about a rare bird or a rare fish in a book, um, but you never expect to see it in real life. And we got to discover it in its natural habitat. Um, <laughs> And like I said, I, I was young and stupid, so I crawled under the deck and got excited and took the pictures. Um, my dad was under there, too. I'm not sure what his excuse was for doing that. Everybody loves pictures of blowouts, so we make sure to litter our book with blowout pictures. Yes, this was our project. Um, we had lots of notes that said confinement steel was required you know, at the at the stressing locations and the anchors dead ends too, but the contractors are absolutely convinced that a construction joint doesn't count. 
until this happens. And then they realize, ah, you know, that concrete didn't know this wasn't the edge of the building. We have a series of conduit pictures in here just <laughs> showing you the misery of what happens in podium decks. This is actually a nice layout. One of the fun early conversations in a when a project is being kicked off is we go in and we say, we'd like the conduit out of the deck. Just take it out of the deck. And somebody says, oh, no, that, that won't be pretty. You know, we're, we're going for the Ansel Adams view of, of below the podium deck. And that's where if, if you're going to buy the book, you should probably buy two copies. Keep one in the office and keep one in the car. And when somebody says something silly, run out to the car, get the book, and show them that there's absolutely nothing pretty going on below a podium deck. All of that plumbing is being hung, lights, everything else. These shiny things, that was our conduit. We actually convinced them to get the conduit out, and that, I think it's the best looking thing in the picture. I think it improves the look. Ansel Adams would be proud. We had a lot of blowout nasty stuff in there, but I'll let you discover that. One thing I want to show you is we show you that tendons can be marked on slabs. So you get a lot of, you know, you can't, this can't be a post-tension concrete building because we need to core later. We tell them we don't want you coring anyway, even if it's not, but it is possible to mark the decks. Brian and my dad put together this. It's, it's, everything you'd ever want to know about slabs on ground. They did a fantastic job. They uh, look at rib slabs. They look at design methodology, the PTI method, um, uniform thickness slabs. You can spend an hour or two just going through all the stuff that they did. It's very nice. I'm almost done here. External post-tensioning. Sorry, let me back up. We have a chapter on external post-tensioning. One of the most fun things that you'll find, we show how to identify lightweight concrete, what corroded tendons look like, what strings look like when that's, everything's unwound, the typical loop that you might see. Uh, dangers, if you're gonna externally post-tension a post-tension building, then you gotta be careful about how you do it. This is one of our projects in, um, in Newport Beach. I take the UCLA students to this, and then after I dazzle them with external post-tensioning, I take them to Joe's Crab Shack. And just like that rare picture of a bird that you think you'd never see, this is actually engineering students having fun uh, in their natural habitat. So it is possible for engineers to have a good time, and I've got photo documentation of that. My 2013 class, the class is growing. 2014, we pretty much dominated the whole place. 2015, Joe's Crab Shack stopped dancing. I don't know that we could have gotten everybody there. This is, by the way, one of the criticisms of our book. We're a little colloquial, um, hillbilly maybe. I put pictures of my students in the book. <laughs> Real textbooks wouldn't do that. This is Cal Poly now, because I'm teaching there, I have to do the same thing, take them out to Crab, and uh, this is the Crack Crab in Pismo Beach, and this is this year's class at UCLA. Anyway, that's it. I think we're going to take a five-minute break. I've been the warm-up band for Brian, and he will now dazzle you with post-tension concrete. So thank you for listening. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, this is Brian Allred. I will be doing the last part of the presentation, which will be a focus on the PT data software and how it's basically used. Uh, it's 12.20 right now. I'm going to go to about 1 o'clock. And I apologize, uh, Dirk went about 20 minutes over, which is the problem when you give or you take Dirk to open mic night. He pretty much takes the entire show. So uh, if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A. And at the end of the presentation, I will try to answer them to the best of my abilities. But if you do have any questions for us that you'd like to ask afterwards, you can email both myself, Brian, or Dirk. It's our first names, B-R-Y-A-N or D-I-R-K at SenecaStructural.com, Seneca Structural, one word. So with that, uh, I'm going to go through quickly uh, some examples of basically how you use PT data to design PT. Um, 
Now, having said that, PT Data, the big pitch we make for PT Data is that this was engineering software made by engineers for engineers. There is only the information you need to design, and I pretty much use this program probably numerous times a day for the last 20 years. So uh, you can use it one-way slabs, beams, girders, mat foundations, uh, two-way slabs, whatever you need, this will do it for you. But it gives you the answer in a very short, concise manner because like most of our uh, us in this profession, we are not paid by the hour or paid by the job. And it's the best to be efficient and accurate and not time consuming and uh, just generating paper for paper. So instead of doing some canned examples, I'm basically just going to show you how this program works. Now, the first thing I'm going to show you how to do is a one way slab. Now, one way slabs are very popular, as you can see in this photograph, for long span garages. Whether you're in the East Coast, the Midwest, or the West Coast, long span garages are a staple of the PT industry. Basically, you have a relatively thin slab that goes from the beams, which are right here the thin slab goes beam to beam to beam and this has been done numerous times it's a very very well produced product it works very well if you're new to post tension a great product to start from because the answer has been done you know half a gajillion times so basically the plumber the electrician and the landscape architect know what the PT should be before you even start um, a lot of times you team up with contractors so it's a very well oiled machine so again if you're new to PT this is a great place to start so we're going to design one two three in a four span condition using PT data so going to the program, you would come in here, hit new one-way slab. From the photograph, we have four spans. So you can pick up the 25, hit four spans. You can pick top and bottom rebar, whatever size you prefer. This is your concrete cover. But the thing to look at on this photograph is right here, the tendon cover to the concrete. You have bottom, or excuse me, top of one inch bottom of one inch and bottom end span. Now, as Dirk mentioned, in post-tension concrete, there is a, a substantial difference on the end span for the fire covers. Whether you have a two, a three, or a four hour rating, this number changes. And it's a prescriptive requirement. So there's really nothing you can do numerically to justify not doing it. And unfortunately, both Dirk and I, Dirk and I have seen engineers go down for not satisfying the prescriptive requirement of the code. So make sure that this number whether it's 1, 5, 2, 2.25, whatever your fire rating is, is different from these two or you're most likely going to violate fire cover. So that is why at PT Data, we make very clear that the end span or what's called unrestrained has a different cover, cover than the other two. Four spans. So what we're going to do is enter the data for the most typical span. That is a span of the slab. So I'm not going to show you the dimensions, but please just bear with me on this one that the first span... Um, We'll just assume a slab thickness of two inches and a support width of 16. So the first span, if you want to change these, we'll go 15, 18, 18, and then 16 and a half. Now the key to post tensioning, whether it's a one-way system, the beams, or a two-way slab, whether it's supporting a pool or a podium, is always a slab thickness, which, which is right here. Now if you can get the slab thickness correct, it's really hard to screw this up. But if you start with a really thin slab, you end up doing very you know, quote unquote, interesting engineering uh, decisions to make it work. So what we did with PT data is we have this button right here. So if you're new to PT or just don't do it that often and don't have a good feeling for what the slab should be, hit this button here, which will bring up this window. The end span length, we have a 16.5. The interior span typically is 18. The superimposed dead and KSF is, let's say, four for a parking structure, and the code live load is 40. So fill in your typical parameters, hit this button, and we'll tell you you should basically be about a five-inch deck. Um, this is not always the absolute answer you should use, but it should get you in the ballpark. So if you're doing a podium structure or you're supporting a park or, let's say, high truck live loads, um, fire trucks, loading trucks, or retail centers, at least you can get in the range before being off by 20 or 30 percent. So now that we should use a five inch slab, we'll close this window, make the slab five inches thick, and we're done. Okay, the next thing we're gonna do is enter the superimposed load for each data, uh, for each span, excuse me. So hit okay. We're gonna use a uniform load since this is parking, hit uniform load. We're gonna put in four pounds a square foot, 40 live, and that goes all across the span. So if you have a typical loading, whether it's office, 
um, retail or parking, that one button will do all four spans for you. So you don't have to enter them individually. However, if you have a very specific condition, you want to add a point load in span four, you would just hit add a load. You can use P for point load, add in two kips, five kips of live load and put it at the dead center of the span. And that will give you the point load for that span. Now, obviously we don't have that in parking. So we're going to remove a load, which is load number two and go back to general pounds per square foot all over the place. Now, the last window you're going to use is the profile of the PT. What type of profile do you want the field to use? Now, typically when you're using a parabolic profile, or excuse me, when you have uniform loads, you use a parabolic profile. So typically one, two, or three is what you would use. Now, one is a simply supported parabolic profile, which in the real world doesn't exist. So that's much more for precast or something that's in analysis or for academic purposes, like Dirk talks about teaching at UCLA or Cal Poly. Now, we would use typically two or three for a parabolic for, a, let's say, a quote unquote real world condition. So, in this application, we're going to use two. And then you can just hit the return button and it will give you the CL and CR dimensions. CL and CR are the center line left and center line right of the column. And since our beams are 16 inches wide, which was the support we chose, you can just hit enter and it will fill in those numbers for you. Now, for some reason, if you want to modify these dimensions, you can just click on that, put in, let's say, 12 inches and do that for you. But if you're just using the standard beam width that you're using, the program will do it for you. Once all that's done, you hit OK. You go back to the original window, hit OK. And then the program itself, based on its algorithm, will give you an initial guess of the PT design, the forces, and the actual drapes of the tendons. Now, for the, all the slabs I've designed and beams, I rarely use this output. But at least it gets you a starting point so you're not just typing in random numbers and trying to get somewhere in the range. So in this situation, it gives you 7.5 kips a foot. That is 125 PSI minimum, which is the accepted minimum for one-way slabs. Typically, the 125 is only applies to two-way systems. There really isn't a minimum for a one-way slab. However, 125 is kind of used as that baseline. Now, what we do, and I know Dirk talked about this, is the importance of balance loads. And so before I check stresses, before I even check rebar, what I would do is look at this column right here, the load balance percent. Now, from a design perspective, I think this is probably the most important column on the entire uh, window here, because if that is between typically 65 to 100 percent, we consider that a good balance load. And that's based on history um, and, you know, lots of people before us designing slabs that have worked well. And if you can balance out 80, 90, 70 percent, whatever that number is that you're happy with of the concrete, typically you have a very good design. So having said that, the PT data will flag you low balance load in at least one span. So the asterisks here and here are obviously both below 65 percent. So we would consider that, you know, not the greatest design. However, having said that, if you look over here, there are no flags for stresses. So your stresses actually work. This is an all ways, technically speaking, a code compliant design. However, from a PT perspective, with a little extra force and maybe some different drapes, you can get better deflection control and even lower stresses. So I'm going to do typical force here. I'm going to put a nine for nine kips a foot and go from there. And as you can see, the balance load immediately changed. And you can see on span one, we went from about 58% to about 71%, which is considered a very good design. So in terms of span one, span two, span three, we're between the 65 and 100. That's a good design. However, we're still below 65% and span four, even though if you look here, all the stresses are satisfied. So again, you're code compliant, you're in the range, and so now you're getting into the kind of touchy-feely gray area. So from our perspective, I would locally just increase that force by double clicking. Let's make it 12 for simplicity. Now we're up to 76%, which again is in the good zone as we would call it. Then after I have all of my forces and my balance loads are good, my P over A is all good at 150 to 200, then at that point I can check the stresses and note there are no flags that says anything's 
not working. Now, having said that, if I make typical force two kips a foot, you'll notice on the right-hand side a lot of red flags. And with anything in life, red flags are bad. And that's telling you at each one of those joints, you're violating the stresses. So regardless of what your balance loads say or everything else, this no longer complies to code. So go back to our previous, um, excuse me, hit nine, make this 12, and we're back to good. So if you do have a stress violation, it will flag you. It'll tell you exactly where that is, and then we go from there. So at this point, this is a good design for balance load. It's a good design for P over A, and the stresses work. You can then go to preview, or excuse me, preview graphic output, which is the, exactly what it should look like. And let me zoom in a little bit for everybody. These are the drapes of the post-tensioning, and these are the exact numbers that should be on your drawings. They should exactly match the construction documents. And so if you print this with your output, a lot of times checking shop drawings or even just red marking your structural drawings is very simple. The program also gives you the rebar, the specific length of the quarter inch, the spacing. And again, this information should go right on your drawings. So within, I believe, five or 10 minutes, even with me talking, this one-way slab is designed and the output will match what we previously had of one and three quarters. You have low points here and one and three quarters there again with the added 12 kips a foot. So this is a good design. It meet, matches it and it's done very quickly with limited uh, like bells and whistles for things that engineers uh, don't require. So going back to PT data, I'm going to exit out of the preview. And then obviously this is a two-way, or excuse me, a, a long span beam. So we have a one-way slab design and now we have a long span beam design. Now the long span beam is going to look something along these lines right here. This is a two-span typical parking structure beam. Again, the long span garages are very popular uh, in the post-tensioning industry. If you've been anywhere near large airports, uh, Las Vegas, anything like that, you've seen these garages and these beams are very typical. So we're gonna have this beam that goes basically from grid C to B, then B to A, 62 feet in each direction. And we'll show you right now how to design this beam that is used all over the place. So the first thing we would do is hit new beam and girder. And since we are, I'm going to lose our data, we're going to say no to saving it. We're going to start the run again. Number of spans, we're going to hit two. Top, bottom rebar, whatever size you want, stirrup, whatever size you want. And again, you have cover for the rebar, which is a different part of the code from cover of the PT, and it has the bottom end span for the fire cover issue that we discussed. You're going to go OK. And then the first thing we're going to do differently then from the one-way slabs is we're going to actually put in columns. One-way slabs are a one foot width strip. They are basically just that really small segment, so you really don't have a column interaction. So we're gonna hit okay to that. We're gonna assume the columns, and I'm sorry my, my input screens are going on my second monitor. We're gonna do 11.33 for uh, 11, 4, 11 feet four inches for ADA. 24, 24 columns are typical, they'll be fixed. And there we go, we're done with the columns. Okay, data. And the next thing we're gonna do is put in the spans. So as we discussed, this will be 62 feet. This will be 62 feet. Excuse me, not two feet. Now the next thing we're gonna do is you have to have different beam systems. You can have a whole different set of beams. You could have a, a 35 inch beam, then a 36 inch beam. You have a lot of variations in what you can or possible, a lot of potential of what you can do. So because for simplicity and time, we're gonna hit A. That will be naming the beam A for both conditions. And then we have to define the geometry. And if you hit this section right there, it'll give you all the potential beam sections that you could possibly use. Obviously, number one is just a standard beam with the equal slabs on both sides. Two has different slab thicknesses. Three is your steel beam form or the Cunningham beam form, which is typical in parking structures. Uh, four, obviously, is upturned. This is just a straight slab. Number seven is a jump in the slab. Five is pretty much any type of weirdo beam you can think of, and eight is for a typical precast section. So for the most part, we're gonna be dealing with number three for long span section. So you hit define the geometry, hit number three, hit okay, and this gives you the typical section profile for that beam. So this is zero, because we're not using anything above the slab. We're gonna have a 35 inch deep beam, a five inch slab, 14 on the bottom, 18 on the top, 18 foot spanning slab, and then here you just hit enter and that'll give you the B effective number 
uh, based upon 16T plus the width of the beam. And that is pretty much all you need to do for the beam geometry. So once that is done, hit OK. Hit OK again. And then a standard loading will hit uniform load. And that covers both spans. So then you're all done. Now again, the next thing we need to do is put in the profile of the PT. Now for beams, we typically use number three. You could also use number two. Again, that's a engineer preference. So just use whatever system you want. And these numbers, A, B, and then the, the uh, ratio of P2 to P1, or excuse me, the C1 dimension, that'll come directly from the program. Again, these are calculated based upon the profile of this para uh, parabola. You don't need to really do anything different. Um, but if you want to, you have the option of changing those parameters. But for the most part, for most all the designs that I do, we just stick with the standard uh, uh, system that comes out, or the standard numbers that come out of the program. Hit OK. Hit OK again. And this gives you, again, an initial design. And like I said previously, I rarely use this, but it gives you a starting point on what to do. So looking at this, you have seven strands right here. You have a drape of at the CGC of the concrete section, low and then high, 192 PSI, which is a good number. But again, we're being flagged that we have low balance loads. So again, even though balance loads are not a code issue, they're not something you can get flagged by the plan checker, it's typically viewed as a very good indicator of efficient designs. So with that, I'm gonna change the strands to nine inches, or excuse me, nine strands. This bumps it up to 76% balance load. The P over A is still good at 247. And now looking at our stresses, everything is out of the red. So that's a good stress design. So within a few minutes, you have a long span beam that is designed for PT. It checks for stresses and you can easily check for um, balance load. Now again, just to illustrate the point, if we were to change this to five strands, you should get a whole bunch of flags in your system that this is no longer a code compliant design. So we're trying to help you not only with the balance load issue, but we're all going to flag you on the bottom stresses and the top stresses if you violate the code. Let's go back to nine, we're back to good, hit preview graphic output. And this is your design. And again, this should match exactly what your drawings show. This is the profile of tendon. So for new engineers or if you're training somebody, a lot of times we will print this output and bring it to the job site and have them look at the as-built condition and make sure, again, that this matches their design, matches their profile. This picks the slab up so it's not reversing gravity. Again, here you have the minimum rebar required for strength and code minimums. The one thing we don't do is give you a number of bars. We're going to allow you as the engineer engineer uh, for 2.37 do you want to use three number eight bars do you want to use four number seven bars you know what variation makes the best choice for you provided you satisfy these minimums and that minimum length you should be good to go and obviously on the bottom here you have the stirrup spacings they are bunched up closer at the center support due to the higher shear and then again all your stirrups are there. So again, this information, besides this specific bar size and call out, you're pretty much done. And then going back to our previous photograph should match exactly what we are showing here, plus minus some additional things for crack controls and, and different aspects. Your structural design is completely covered in the PT data output. Now, having said that, I'm gonna close this window I'm going to go back to the main menu, and obviously we have to produce calculations if you're in the West Coast for plan checking. I know some of the East Coast systems don't have a plan check process. Now, if you're interested in any other aspect of the uh, results, you can go to the review menu and pretty much everything you ever need to know about your beam or your slab is covered in these columns. So let's say you're very concerned about deflection. You would check deflection and cracking moment. The deflection is right here for dead and balance loads. Live load deflection is right there. So if you want to add those up, that will give you a total deflection on both spans. Um, now if you're more interested in an L over 1200 number of where you are, you can go to main menu. Go to File, hit Print Preview Text Output, and this will give you the output that you would include in your calculations of the building department. And going down um, 
you can see right here in the deflections checks, it gives you the dead plus balance and live load and gives you the L over numbers. And typically for the most part, if you are dealing with good balance loads and the right slab thickness, your, your deflections, unless you have tremendously high live loads, should be relatively low, almost to the point where you don't need to check them. Now, obviously with a long span beam, it's gonna have a very large crank on the columns. And so from the output itself right here, you get the center line moment of the columns in both the conditions conditions of top moment, or excuse me, moment on the bottom of the joint and moment on the top of the joint. Obviously there's none at the center support in this condition, but most of the moment comes on the edge columns due to that crank and then that's obviously how you would design the column itself. Now the one thing that we um, use in PT data that we think is very important, especially for beam systems, is that it, you come to tools and you say change configuration. The one thing that this menu does is give you all the load factors that you want to use. So if you're using something other than 318, 08, or 11, let's say you're analyzing an existing building that was done 25 years ago and they had different load factors, this is where you would change it. But also importantly is this thing right here, this little window window right here, column modeling options. This program assumes the top column is present for superimposed superimpose loads only, meaning that if you have a system that is built and the top column will not be built till after your beam is done, which is basically 99% of the structures out there, that top column does not help for the gravity loads of the concrete because when the tendons are stressed and the beam forms are moved, there is no top column. So those top columns are only, to correctly analyze a system, can only be present for their stiffness and the moment distribution for superimposed loads, not for the concrete weight because the column is not there during the system. So having said that, so far we have a one-way slab, we have a beam, um, long span beam, and so hopefully you can see that relatively quickly you can have a whole long span garage, modify your beam widths, modify your span lengths, and so forth, and design these systems. Now, one of the other things that we have added recently that I'm going to go through, uh, excuse me, relatively quickly because I know I'm running out of time, is the new two-way mat slab option. It seems like in the last five or six years we've run out of all good soil sites and now we're going to either piles or mat slabs everywhere. And so we modified uh, the two-way slab option to include a mat slab, excuse me, we modified the typical elevated two-way slab uh, algorithm to make it a two-way mat slab. Now a mat slab is not to be confused with residential foundations which are the PTI method. These are structural slabs that are going to support a two, four, six, ten story tall building. Now from a drawing perspective it's going to look something like this where we're going to design these uniform strands going left to right across the building. This is a 30 inch thick mat. It's going to support a nine story parking structure. And so this is a you know very serious concrete section at 30 inches. It's supporting a tremendous amount of superimposed load. And we have to get the profile uh, obviously correct to make stresses. But the trick or the rub on mat foundations, especially with post tensioning, is the fact that you are putting in these tendons and putting in a drape to support a building that's not going to be there for six, nine, or 12 months. So you can't overbalance the system at all, basically because that building, that load is never going to be there. And in difference or in, in conflict with an elevated slab, at least elevated slabs are connected to columns and walls. They have some restraining element. A mat slab is just as you pour the concrete and stress the tendons, there's no columns. It's just laying on dirt. So it has no restraint whatsoever. So putting in huge balance loads to resist loading that won't be there for another year just ends up cracking up the slab or causing a whole bunch of problems. So we're gonna design these tendons right here going left to right. Open up PT data, hit new two-way mat slab. No, we don't want to save. We're going to do a um, six-span condition, which we saw in the photograph. Again, here, the one major difference is you'll notice there is no end span requirement for the bottom. Now, obviously, on a mat slab, you're against the dirt. So if you have a fire underneath the earth, earth I think we have much bigger problems than fire cover for PT. That's pretty apocalyptic. So basically, the bottom cover of three inches is going to be if you're pouring concrete directly on the soil, which would be the same thing for you know, rebar concrete, um, anything like that. So that part of it shouldn't apply anymore. 
So we have six spans, we're gonna get okay. Now notice on here, it just says top column and not bottom column. Obviously there's no bottom column in a matte slab because it's on the dirt. So we're gonna go uh, standard parking structure, let's go 10 feet. We'll go a 24 by 14 column and we'll call it fixed at the next level up. Hit okay. Um, this member or this design window is for transverse beams. Now, if you have an elevated structure or even a matte slab and perpendicular to your rung, you're putting in a transfer beam for something else and you just want to model that, this is where you would put it. But since we're doing a matte slab and there's no transfer beams, just put N and that clears the entire window. So as I mentioned previously, again, getting the slab thickness is critical. So and again, let's say you don't know what the slab thickness should be. Hit this window here, suggest slab T. Maximum end span is about uh, 14 feet. Typical interior is 34 feet. The dead load is 1 KSF. The live load is 0.22. Now, obviously, you're going to have to believe me on these numbers, but trust me, they're accurate. So then we take that loading, and you get roughly 24 inches. And we're also going to tell you column caps or thickened areas of the columns should be used. That's going to be help you with the design. Now, the one thing I will say about the slab thickness for PT data on the mat option is that there's a lot of there's a lot more than just the PT slab thickness for structural reasons that go into a mat. So this is a good minimum number, I would say, but typically because you're dealing with differential settlements, you need to have a mat that is at least stiff enough to handle that distribution of load and to spread the loads out and also to minimize differential settlements. This may be thicker than that. So the 24 inches that you get in this example is a good limit, a good minimum number, but typically it may be higher. So we're gonna close that window we're going to add in our spans at 13 feet. We're going to use a slab of 30 inches. We're going to do a typical total trip of 28.17. Now, the, obviously, these all come from the dimensions from the plans, which I did not provide to you. Um, we're also going to use a cap or a thickened area. And for reasons I'll explain in a little bit, we're going to use 168 excuse me, which is 14 feet, and a typical cap depth of 45 inches. Now, graphically, that stuff is shown right here. W1 and W2 are the square dimensions of the cap, or the north, south, and east, west dimensions. And the total cap H includes the slab. So you're, you're going to use a 6, a 12, or a 15-inch projection below the system. And that is what your, basically, capital, if you're used to, or drop panel, if you're used to elevated slab, is going to look like. Hit OK. Go to the loading. Go to uniform load, do one KSF, two live load. That covers all spans. We're going to go to PT. Now notice, we're going to tell you right away, for matte slab designs, the profiles we're saying are reversed. Now, in a matte slab, the load comes from the soil. As the columns push on the soil, the soil pushes up on the mat. So you're going to be pushing down on the soil. So all of these profiles are reversed. We're just giving you the heads up that, yes, we didn't change the window. But when you build this thing and when you design it, these drapes are all reversed. So we're going to choose two. And again, I apologize. My window is showing up on my second monitor. The program does everything for you. So all you have to do is hit OK. Hit OK again. And there's your design. And lean, th this is a good starting point. Now, note there's two things that we start off with before we start messing with the design. First of all, this window or these two columns right here, 125 PSI minimum. That is a two-way slab requirement. Even though this is in the dirt and it is a foundation, the two-way um, requirements of the 125 still apply. And it needs to cover the cap area. So if you have a thickened area for typical gravity design, it needs to have 125 per the code. Again, that's prescriptive, and it's one of those thou shall not things. So that's why this is set at 125, and the 156 is because once you get outside of the cap era, area, you have less area, so the PSI goes up. Now note, over here on this window, we have very good stresses. Actually, everything's in compression. We actually don't have neck tension. The problem is that you're balancing 241% of the dead 
dead weight of concrete. So when you stress that concrete, you're pushing up on every span with about 250% of its self weight. And again, there's no restraining elements. There is nothing. This is just naked gray concrete on dirt. And cranking in that much force and that much uplift is going to cause you a lot of issues with cracking. You can get cambering. You can even get blowouts. So because these are mats, and again, because the load will not be there for months, if not years, we try to keep the balance loads really, really small so you don't have these issues. So because the 59.47 uh, gives us 125, let's stick to 60 strands, which gives us 56.7 kips a foot, which is what the drawing show. And then we're going to go through and modify the mid-span numbers to get these balance load down to very acceptable limits and hopefully that doesn't kill the stresses. So instead of going through the whole process of playing the game, I'm just going to type in the final numbers. And notice on this window, the balance loads are all less than 65%. Now, you would say typically, wait a second, I thought you said 65% was the good number. And it is for elevated structures. When you do a mat foundation, again, because it is not battling deflections, you are permanently against the dirt and there are no restraining elements and you're just cranking in PT, you got to keep these things low. We typically shoot for less than 50% or 60% and basically as low balance forces as you can get to make the stresses work is the right number. Now looking at this one, you can see 9% in span one. When you have really short spans, the numbers really start wreaking havoc. So at this one, you can see your nine and a quarter. If that becomes 9.75, it goes up by half of an inch which is, you know, obviously not very much in a 30-inch deck, that goes from 9% to 45%. So if there is a jump in, or there is a jump in the tendons in the field or they use the wrong chairs, you know, God forbid they use an inch bigger chair, so we go to 10.25, that all of a sudden goes a factor of nine times up from 9% to 81. So typically in very short spans, we like to keep the balance loads relatively low. So again, if there is a whoops in the field, you're not suddenly 200% overbalanced. So these are good balance loads. Those are good stresses. We seem to be pretty happy with our design. And then you go preview graphic output. Excuse me. Um, and this is what the tendon should look like. And again, they're graphically drawn correctly. We're going to be low over the columns, come up high over midspan. Again, you're pushing down on the soil, which is pushing up on your building. So that's why these tendons are all reversed in comparison to what they should be, let's say, for an elevated structure. And again, the rebar is given to you at 6.25 off the center line of the columns, the minimum numbers, and you can change this to number sixes, number sevens, number eight bars, whatever you'd like. Now, in this situation, the other thing to check, which is always a thing to check in two-way slabs, is that you always have to check punching shear. Now, in punching shear, we give you two options. There's section one and section two. Now, obviously, if this did not work, there'd be red flags all over this point, which I'll get to in a little bit. But in section one and section two, um, this is very different, or it's, it's different than elevated structures. If you're doing a mat slab, and you're using an uh, elevated slab program and just kind of tweaking it a little bit, which is totally fine, to design your slabs. This is what you have to be careful of. For section one, you have a column coming down, and that is the section. It goes all through the, the slab and cap thickness, which makes perfect sense and works in both directions. The problem is, if you're using an elevated slab program, it's assuming the cap goes down and the column is on this side of the situation. So your shear plane two, starts from here and goes this way. It gets bigger off the cap. That's not the way it is in a mat because the column is reversed. So in a elevated structure, section two is a lot larger than section two would be for a mat foundation. So if you're checking punching shear on an elevated program, you're actually overestimating your punching shear strength and that could be a problematic. So make sure if you're not using something like PT data or a mat foundation program that was specific, your punching shear is somewhat skeptical because you're overestimating size of number two. So having said that, again, deflections are good. You can check um, deflections if you'd like to. These should all be basically zero because of the stiffness of the mat. You have flexural concrete stresses. If you want to check anywhere along the span of uh, the length of those spans, what the concrete stress is on the bottom, on the top, what the transfer loads are, there's pretty much every single thing number you would ever want on PT. The one thing we don't do is we don't 
provide that in the output. So the output for this in terms of the plan checker or for the process of um, submittal is always basically exactly what you would need, where the rebar is, you know, these are the spans, these are the columns, uh, these are the slab column moments, this is your profile which should match the calculations on the drawings, or the, uh, the, the words on the drawings. And um, we basically just keep it as succinct as possible. But if you want more information, it's always available in the review menu. Now, I realize I'm running out of time, and I'm going to do one more quick example, kind of show you the things that you should not do and things to look out for if you're designing um, something. So tricks of the trade, we'll call it. So the next thing we're going to do is a two-way slab. And I'm going to do this very quickly because I know I'm running out of time, and I, I appreciate your patience. So I'm going to choose a three-way slab, or excuse me, a three-span slab. I'm going to go, uh, excuse me, 10 foot, 24, 24. We have no beams. I'm going to use an 8 inch slab. I'll use uh, 16, 30, 16, typical trib of 29 feet. Look how fast this is. Um, and I'm going to then say we designed a parking structure, but then all of a sudden they changed it and they want to put fire truck loads on it. And you don't want to increase the slab thickness. Now, again, if we say OK to all this and go through the input data, we have everything set up. Now, again, let's say we check on suggest slab thickness. And again, you're not really sure what slab thickness to use. Use this window. This will tell you, you should probably be about 10 and a half inches and column cap should be used. Now, because you don't trust me, you don't trust the program, and you've already told the architect eight inches is gonna work, this is the kind of danger area or problems that you can get into. So let's close this window, run the analysis at 250 pounds a square foot, which is storage loading or truck loading, hit the analysis, and right away, there's a couple big problems here. Um, First of all, we have different strands all over the place, which is not that big of a deal. So let's just simplify this, make it 49 for the numbers. At least by doing that, we took the stresses away. Now, previously, let me go back to our previous design, you blew out the two uh, the stresses on the joints at six square root, which is 424. So we're going to tell you exactly where you have problems. The other thing that be careful of is, again, look at the balance loads you're at 190%. So let's make stresses work first. Let's say we really don't care about balance loads, so we don't believe in that theory. We'll go to 49 strands, and magically, the stresses do conform to the code. Now, technically, this is a code-compliant design, but there's a couple things you gotta be careful of, and Dirk and myself have done a lot of peer reviews, and the thing that we found over the years is there's a lot of great software out there, um, slick stuff, sophisticated. Uh, the problem is it makes it very, very easy to do things that those don't make any actual sense. And these are the things you really need to look out for. First of all, look at this, 470 PSI. Typically, most two-way slabs are considered a good design if you're less than 250, 275. Um, if you have a couple isolated areas at 300 PSI, fine. But if you're consistently at 470, that should set out red flags that your slab is way too thin. Let's go back and say, fine, that you don't care about P over A, that doesn't bother you so much. Your balance load is 200%. So you're cranking up on each span with 200% more than the concrete weighs. So when that concrete is placed on Friday and you're stressing it on Monday, you're going to be cranking it up with 300 pounds a square foot on an 8-inch slab that only weighs 150 pounds a square foot. That's never a good idea. You're going to camber it up. You're potentially going to create blowouts. But if you're going to put in more load than the concrete weighs, you're going to put reverse tensile stresses on the bottom of the slab joint where you actually have no rebound. You're, you're so reversing gravity and so reversing the way we typically reinforce slabs that where you have tensile stresses, where you should have rebar, you have nothing. So that's obviously very problematic. The other thing is, if you look at the number of strands, we're at 49 strands. And if you remember from our input, we're only at 29 feet wide. That's basically one strand every seven inches. That's physically extremely challenging to build. However, Having said all of that stuff that I've just done, if you look over here, you're six square root or less. This is a code compliant design, and we've seen this done before. There is no maximum pre-compression value in the code. There's a minimum of 125, but there's really effectively no maximum. The balance load is not a code issue. It will never come up in the output, and a plan checker will never ask you 
to show that or show verification that you've even checked it. But again, hopefully we're showing you this is exactly not what to do, but by overbalancing the system and putting in a tremendous amount of PT, basically putting so much P over A that you knock down the M over S stress, you can make thin slabs work. Now the other thing to look at is the rebar. Looking at the rebar, 15 number fives, number four is at 20 inches on center, that doesn't sound so bad. That is not, you know, a horrifically amount of or a horrific amount of rebar. It's reasonably spaced over a 29 foot trib, and number four is at 20 is a pretty, you know, not horrifically amount. So just looking at a strength design approach and not looking at the balance load or the P over A, you could think this is a decent design, even though it works numerically, but performance perspective, you're going to have a whole bunch of issues. Now, the next thing you can do, or you should do, is always check punching shear. Now, we didn't use a cap or a drop panel, so you check punching shear here, and right away you have these four red flags that are showing you that you have a punching shear failure. You failed the code allowable of 251 KS or PSI, excuse me. And if you're at close to 700 PSI and the baseline is 251, you're missing it by a factor of two or three, which is obviously going to be tough to work with shear studs. Now, the one thing PT data will help you with is this button right here, which says design the caps. You hit that one right there and give it a few minutes or a few seconds, and it will basically give you a W1 dimension of eight foot six, W2 dimension, and an H that it thinks it's going to work. Now, the thing is here, if you want to modify that, let's say you don't like eight foot six, or you don't like 17 inches, the program immediately takes you back to the input page. So you hit OK here, and you can see it added these numbers in for you. So let's take this, and let's say we don't like 17, you can just make it 18, like round numbers one foot six, hit OK again, and then it goes back to your profile. Now note one thing here, immediately we've gone down the PT. We have, we're not back at 49 strands. If we go back to the previous profile, um, we're way under stress. We're at 0.33. One of the things that a cap will do for you at the columns, especially at the high stress zones, is that you increase the A, so your P over A goes down, obviously, and you increase the S, so your M over S stress goes down. It gives you a dramatic reduction in your stresses. So because of that, let's go back and just say we're going to use 30 strands for simplicity. So again, just because you've added this monster 9-foot cap, you've taken away about 20 strands. You're still kind of high PSI, but it's, it's reasonable, and your balance loads are still 100%, over 100%, but they're not back at 200. So there is a definite improvement here. So go to review menu, hit punching shear analysis again, check section one, and then, oh, section two still fails. It just fails by a little bit. So always check sections one and section two, because a lot of times the size of the cap, if it's the width and depth are not in that proper proportion, you're going to bust one. Now looking at this, we're going to tell you what section two is and section one. And section two is governed by the width of the cap. So instead of using 102, let's go backwards and make this 108 or 1,085. That would work too, probably. Previous profile gives you 30 strands. Review menu, punching shear, check one, check two. Everything checks out. There's no red flags. And you're done. And here is your design. So my point in showing you this is a be very careful of using thinner slabs to support high superimposed loads. You can numerically show and do kind of interesting uh, engineering applications of numerics and torture numbers to make it work. But when you look at how much PT you're putting in, how much compression load, which typically leads to more movement and more cracking, and the fact that you're overbalancing the system by 100% of its self weight, it's just going to go poorly at some point. Now, the converse is if you try to use PT data and you want to use caps, we will give you a very good starting point of what that cap size should be, at least to get you in the ballpark. So, is it a seven foot cap? Is at a four foot cap and if you're using a podium slab or a pool start the design have the system design the cap for you and then modify that as you need it to make stressing work and to make your size requirements uh, work out for you so with that i've gone uh, looks like a whopping four minutes over so thank you for your patience um, if you have any questions please type them in the box or send me and dirk an email and hopefully you've enjoyed the seminar and learned something about the book that we wrote and also pt data 
Thank you for your time. Okay, um, questions. Um, first one, Dirk, uh, Dirk and Brian, it's not really a question. Good job. Uh, good job, Dirk. Brian, you're an attractive, handsome man. Yes, it is true. Thank you very much for noticing. Um, next question. Uh, does the program work with metric? Yes, it does work with metric. We do have a metric option. Um, it has been used uh, at a, a couple locations um, in Europe, but there is an option uh, for that if you need that. So just let us know and uh, we'll help you out. Uh, next question, can you input segmented beams and slabs? Uh, yes, you can. We offer, actually we offer two programs. One is PT Data and the other one is called PT Plus. Um, which I did not show you, which I'll do that right now. PT Plus basically, um, let me move this over if you can see it. PT Plus is shown right here. Um, basically, it is the PT data version on steroids. Uh, you can pretty much do any single thing you want. Openings and slabs, beams with different widths, different depths, different heights at different locations. I mean, you can model pretty much anything that you can even think of in a PT Plus program. Now, having said that, it's a little more time consuming to use. It's not as quick and as useful as PT data, but um, like I said, if you have a very unique condition or you're designing or you're checking an existing structure uh, that has some uniqueness to it or they've cored a whole bunch of holes and you want to check the beam works, uh, PT Plus is, is what you would definitely use and it will give you more information than you ever thought you would ever need. So that would be the option for something that's non-prismatic or changes at numerous locations. Next question, um, is there an API to control the program for other programs? Uh, not at this time, no. There is no API uh, for that system. Is the input file user editable? Um, in terms of the source code, no, if, that, if that's the question. The source code is not um, editable, uh, editable, but what we have done previously, if, if one of our um, clients that have used the program for a while has a certain specific request, um, that they always like to use, you know, a cover of two inches, not one inch or something. We have made some modifications, but for the most part, the the self the code itself is is not usable or editable. Excuse me. Edit editable. Not, I guess I'm hungry. I haven't had lunch yet, so I'm now thinking of my stomach. Um, do you consider wide shallow beams? Absolutely. Uh, they're usually called slab bands, and we actually have a function in the program to do that. Um, if you can see my screen. I'm going to the two-way slab segment I just did. If you go to change slab and geometry, this right here, BW and, or beam W and beam H are wide shallow beams. They're basically meant for, if you have an eight inch slab, you could put a 48 inch wide beam that is a total of 12 inches deep in that area centered on that design strip and that will account for it in the balance loads and that will account for it in your system. So if, you, if we just zero this out, and do this system, let's say we're going to use 15 strands, note the dre the depth of these tendons is 10 and a quarter inches. Obviously that's a substantially less than 8 inches. So the program will account for wide shallow beams anywhere along the length um, and assumes the tendons will go into that segment for you. Uh, next question. Uh, do punching shear calculations consider openings? Uh, in the PT data program, no, but in the shear stud program, they would consider openings, but also in the PT plus program, if you have an opening that is you know, large enough to, to generate concern, the PT plus uh, software will give you that option to, to model multiple or single openings adjacent to the columns. Um, the the, is there an input for the subgrade modulus? For the mat slab option, uh, no. The subgrade modulus is much more of an issue for PT slabs on ground for residential structure because of the uh, limited uh, P over A of 50 PSI in the system. These are much more considered to be um, elevated structures and because if the PTI minimum let's say is 50 PSI we're typically putting in more of the 100 to 75 to 200 PSI range so the subgrade modulus isn't that severe usually the program or the parameter that is most useful for us is the spring constant to design the slab thickness uh, to make sure that we're modeling the soil correctly but in terms of subgrade uh, that's not an input parameter in the mat foundation 
um, for diaphragm design is the strut and tie method used. Um, and the diaphragm design, no. Our design methodology, as I'm sure Dirk mentioned, is using the entire diaphragm itself as a concrete element and not so much the strut and tie methodology. Um, this is obviously a very uh, important question, and we've actually written, uh, obviously, a chapter in the book is all about um, diaphragm designs, and this is a you know, this answer is a long one. But if you go through the chapter itself, it'll give you every answer you have about how we do diaphragms, how we utilize PT, and the shear capacity of the system. But to answer your question, no, the strut and tidal model is not used in our design. Uh, next question: You showed the uniform load on the mat slab. How about if we want input both point loads from columns on mat slab? How do we input those? Basically, um, the program itself is assuming that the slab is stiff enough and the soil is stiff enough that when the columns come down and load the slab, it is basically going to uniformly spread out on that soil. Now, in general, if you were to have um, a site where, let's say, you had a very stiff soil and the load, came, and the load from the column did not amortize out over the entire span by assuming it goes out equally all over so you have a general load of 2 KSF rather than high loads of the columns and then tapers down the moments are more severe using a distributed load all over the place than having it very localized and it obviously doesn't change the punching shear because the load is the load so having a uniform load spread out is usually the more conservative approach than trying to figure out if your spring constant uh, condenses a load you know, closer to the column without amortizing out. So to answer your question, it does not have that option. And the reason why is because of basically it's the more conservative approach to spread the load out. Um, next question, not source input file to run. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Uh, next one, for two-way podium slabs, if the deflection fails in some region and you have to thicken the slab, how do we input that? Well, b basically, if you have to thicken it in the entire span, obviously, in that particular span, if you can look at my screen, you would have, um, you could obviously change this one to 12 inches or, you know, whatever you want it to be. So if you have some an average, you could, you know, easily make it 9.75 inches. If you only doing, let's say, the middle portion of the slab let's say for some reason the the middle 15 feet of a 30 foot slab are going to be thickened that would require the pt plus program because then you could have the first seven and a half feet be 12 inches the middle 15 feet have um, 18 inches and then, then the other feet be uh, 12 inches stuff like that we would typically in a podium slabs, if we have the right slab thickness and the correct balance loads uh, deflections rarely are an issue in terms of um, um, our structures, uh, basically with the balance load and the fact that we can use eye gross, not eye effective, usually the deflections, like I showed in the seminar, are usually extremely low. But if you did have that option and you wanted to do that, the PT Plus software would be um, the option for you. Next uh, question, does your punching shear program take into account adjacent openings adjacent to columns? I covered that and that's actually an excellent question. Uh, next comment, how about creep, shrinkage, and support restraints? How are these included in the calculations for deflection? Well, basically, for shrink, uh, uh, creep, shrinkage, and support restraints, that's an entirely different uh, analysis. Obviously, if you have uh, shear walls, you're going to have restraint issues, and the amount of pre-compression that you lose or the cracking that occurs because of the location of those shear walls can have an impact on the performance and some of the deflections. But typically, those have to be done more of a localized condition than trying to use the program to do that. Um, when you deal with restraint, obviously, you can have some pre-compression issues if you have a long, long shear wall that's that's trying to resist a load. But in terms of ultimate strength and initial stressing and balance loads, those aren't affected. So that we sign, we find that much more of a um, individual detailing issue than a software design issue. Next question, if there is a podium slab that is on top of basement walls, how do you consider the restraining effects of the walls on the deflection calculations? Well, it depends on, um, you, you can model the basement walls. So if you have a you know 30 foot wide 
trib and you have a 30 foot wide wall and it's completely locked in you can model that wall uh, most times if we're in a basement condition we don't connect physically in terms of a rebar connection the slab to the walls so we basically have a pin connection and that's how we try to promote it and again that's not so much for restraint issues in terms of gravity but it's restraint of the movement of the slabs if you lock up an entire building that's 200 feet by 400 feet and it has nowhere to move and you lock it up to the walls it's going to crack and crack severely so in those situations we only model the walls where they are hard tied for their localized effect but typically we would slip the walls to the best of our abilities so we don't get that restraining effect but if you did lock it up if it lets you had a relatively small plate um, you could model them it just it's the modeling of the columns and you can model them however you want and adjust the length or the pinned or fixed to give you the connection you're looking for uh, next question besides your book what other references for PT design do you recommend um, well basically our book is the only actual book you should ever use so I can't think of anything else that comes close um, but having said that and all joking aside um, PTI the post tensioning Institute does have some nice books the sixth edition um, the PT handbook is very good uh, I'm currently on the building committee 20 which has a document about general design philosophies uh, for one-way slabs beams and two-way slabs and there's a lot of good information in there it doesn't have the the um, amount of information that our book does but um, they are available through PTI and your PTI definitely has some good uh, recommendations or did publications um, for alternate materials but in terms of the global amount of PT knowledge uh, it's hard to beat our book next question does the program does the program uh, does the program can be used for grout as systems according to 31814 I mean there is the option to use a, a bonded system in the software and for the most part there's not a whole lot of change to the analysis it's more of a rebar issue than anything else so it's just the F, really the FPS equation I think there may be some slight changes to uh, the rebar minimums for a bonded system rather than unbonded but for the most part it's the same analysis it just comes down to the FPS equation um, do keeping the balance load in the correct range help deal with differential curling due to wind or temperature uh, effectively no I mean the balance loads are only there to effectively remove or minimize the deflections created by the concrete self weight now in most applications your structure whether it's a hotel a podium or a pool uh, the vast majority of your weight comes from the concrete itself especially in um, an office building or a parking structure basically the concrete set so if you can balance out the concrete dead weight that usually helps with stresses as we showed and Dirk mentioned it also helps with deflections but in terms of you know differential weather issues or temperature or finishing uh, it really has very little to do with that the one thing it does do is with PT one of the nice construction benefits is that when you build the slab on a Friday and you stress it on Monday you're getting all that pre-compression into the system when the when the concrete is still kind of setting up and kind of in the green state so one of the other things that um, the book mentions a lot of is stressing that PT as soon as possible so if you get that 150 250 uh, pounds a square inch of compression into that system that's going to help with crack control just in general so uh, it does help with some crack control but not the curing of wind uh, next question what kind of balance load do you allow for cantilever slabs uh, cantilever slabs um, are, are a little tricky because um, typically a cantilever slab has the anchorage obviously for dead ends or live ends and if you over crank them too much you can lift the slab up kind of a springboard effect and especially for an apartment or a condo project if your balconies lift up and you reverse the flow of water uh, no one's happy about that so those balance loads we really take a hard look at and a lot of times if they're relatively short spans short cantilevers we don't balance them at all we'll keep the tendons flat and just use rebar to make it work because again when you get into the short spans whether it's a 10 foot column to column or a five foot cantilever slight variations in those strands can have a dramatic numerical effect on the balance loads so for the smaller ones we just leave it alone and for the bigger ones we try to keep it below 90 percent or so but keep it way afar from 100 percent because that can get you some some unfavorable deflections is it conservative not to use restraining effects? I'm assuming you mean for the shear walls themselves. Uh, I don't think it's 
either way, conservative or not, uh, it's not going to change the analysis or the design. The, the biggest issue with restraining effects is the cracking of the slab. Um, now, as I'm sure Dirk mentioned, the reason we're using post-tensioning, and I'm assuming the reason a lot of you are listening, besides the fact that this seminar is free, which is you know always a good part, um, is the fact that PT will save your owner and your architect money. Typically, the slabs are two or three inches thinner than the rebar equivalent, and you can take four to five pounds a square foot of rebar out, which is a huge financial savings, which is one of our greatest tools. The other issue with that is since you don't have top and bottom rebar in each direction, if you lock up your slab, you can get some pretty severe cracking in these systems because there just isn't all that superfluous rebar to resist it. And we have an entire chapter in the book on restraint to shortening, slip details, shear walls, where you put them, how do you connect it so it doesn't um, you know, restrain the system. That's an entirely different webinar um, that I, I probably should give at some point if people are interested. But in terms of the numeric design, uh, we don't consider the restraining effects unless it's you know, unless you know you're going to have a very severe problem and you're trying to account for a PT loss. But for most conditions, no. Next question. Uh, can we model cantilever slabs and beams? Absolutely. Uh, there is. If you can look at my screen, if you go to the general input table, you have the number of spans here. And then you can have a left and right cantilever. So let's choose a right cantilever. We come here. We'll just use 8 inches, make it a 12-foot cantilever, 14.5 trib. Very enough, you can put a cantilever in. Now you have a cantilever and a shallow wide beam. And then the next thing you would do is when you come to uh, tendon profiles, you obviously have to create a tendon profile for a cantilever, which would be number eight, number nine, or number 10. Since we're using a pounds per square foot loading, we would use number nine. That would give you the center line dimensions of the columns, and that's how you would model a cantilever, and the program will account for that and model it accordingly. So if you were to do the run, um, you have 16 strands here, 13 here, and that gives you a cantilevered profile, and that gives you the balance load in that particular cantilevered condition. So then you can adjust the number of strands to bring that up to something that you're a little more comfortable with, you know, whatever that is, and that will give you the profile that you're looking for. So modeling cantilevers and beams is definitely possible. Wow, there's a lot of comments. Okay, um, let me see here. Next question, how can we model the pore strip in a slab? Uh, it's an excellent question. Now, obviously, most buildings, whether it's a two-way slab or a one-way slab, will have the potential for pore strips. A lot of times how we do that is the main difference between a slab and a slab with a pore strip is the location of the tendon. The tendon will typically be at the CGC of the slab at the pore strip location because that's where the anchor is installed whether it's a stressing end or a dead end so what we typically do is model the entire slab 10 strands or 10 spans 20 strands whatever it is uh, sorry 10 spans or 20 strands and let's say at span seven there is a pore strip in that bay um, we will use uh, the PT at the CGC of the system to model where the anchors are and then do a secondary analysis to um, add rebar accordingly to make up the difference because you're not going to have any PT in the pore strip. And again, that's much more detailed in the book itself. But it's not really modeling it in terms of a cantilever, which you can do if you have a quarter pore strip, but it's more or less modeling where the tendon will be in the as-built condition to make sure you don't get superficial uh, balance loads or moment capacity. Um, can the program be used to design a PT slab on grade on highly expansive soils? Uh, no, it cannot. The mat foundation option is purely a structural mat foundation option. Um, it's solely for basically an elevated slab that's poured on dirt. Um, there are a couple of good programs out there for PT slabs on grade, but unfortunately, um, this isn't one of them. If we have a beam and a two-way slab along the span, could that be modeled? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think I showed that previously, but I'll go back. If you have a beam or a, a two-way slab, you can go to change slab geometry. And this thing right here, BM width and BMH, basically it will look just like this um, with these dimensions. The H is the same one you use for the cap. And the BM would W would uh, replace W1 or W2. So if you have a localized beam, whatever depth it is, the tendons will go or have the potential to go into that deep in section. So you get the benefit for additional moment capacity and additional um, strength. So you have that in any span or no spans, anywhere you want, you can put that in um, into the system for PT data. 
Uh, next question. What practical limit do you recommend for cantilevers in one or two way slabs? Uh, typically, we're in the, I would say, about quarter point of the span. So if you have a 30 foot trib, or excuse me, a 30 foot typical span, you're typically in the seven and a half to eight foot range. That typically will get you a full drape on the tendons. If you go anything more than that, it is possible. But I mean, again, depending on your slab thickness, you can start getting kind of bouncy systems and, and, um, um, you know, un, 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 uh, desirable deflection. So if you can keep it in that general range, a quarter of the bigger typical span, you're typically the slap thickness will work and the general PT layout should be relatively effective. Uh, next question is, thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome. Hopefully it helped out. Uh, I mean the max cantilever, cantilever length, which hopefully I answered in the last one. And the last question, unless there's any others, is should secondary moment be added to the column moment to design the columns? Um, the secondary moment is included into the actual PT data output, so everything is there in the entire system, so you don't have to do a separate analysis to design the columns or the foundations or anything else. Um, so yes, it is embedded in the program, and if you go through the entire uh, review menu, all that information is provided for you, but the program itself is self-contained in, in the sense of the PT and what is being added or applied to the columns or the girder. So it is self-supporting. Uh, okay, one more question. Please keep them coming. How much on an effect on a on an effect does concrete strength have? Um, for the most part, the higher strength concrete, typically about 5,000 PSI is what we do. And obviously higher strength concrete, when you take a six square root number or nine square root for beams and slabs or 12 square root, obviously you have a higher limit of your stresses. And for the most part, because of the nature of post-tensioning, if you have um, st stressing going to occur in three days, typically we have higher early concrete, that's 3,000 in three days uh, concrete. If you get 3,000 in three days, you're going to get 5,000 in probably 14 days by default. So you might as well benefit from that. I know some people use 4,000 PSI concrete, but again, because of just the nature of construction and how quickly we need that concrete to come up so we can stress, typically you're going to get 5,000. Now, if you're in a situation where you're really having a hard time making stresses work, but you don't want to add any more PT because you're already high pre-compression, uh, people have gone to six and 7,000 PSI concrete to help, you know, make that work. But for the most part, for the things that we see, 5,000 is typically what people use and, and it works, you know, works very well. Um, last question. I didn't quite follow the portrait design. Is it possible for you to show the input? Sure. Um, let's go back here. If everyone's still watching, let's just make this um, seven spans. I'm just going to go through this quickly just so I don't get a bunch of zeros. Do that. Use an eight-inch slab. Let me get rid of that. Typical span length is 30. Um, tell you what, let me get rid of uh, the cantilever. I'll just make my life easier. Um, let's just make. Okay, and then make sure we have the right. Sorry, there's a zero there. Okay, so if we do this, let's run the program. And let's say at span four, we had a pore strip. Now this is an eight inch deck, so the CGC will be at four inches. And obviously here, by putting it at four inches, that's where the tendon's going to be in the pore strip, since it's running flat through the pore strip and you're anchoring. And this is assuming a mid-span pore strip. If you had a quarter point pore strip, that would be somewhat different. Now, even though this is a pore strip, you can see we're having problems with stresses. So at this point, I'll just change the stress or change the PT a little bit. Uh, make it 19 strands instead of 18. So again, you have to satisfy stresses because that's where the PT is going to be placed at mid-span of the pore strip. But that profiles it. It shows you where the PT is. You're not over accounting for balance loads or moment strength. Now, the one thing you'll have to do is that in those pore strips, um, if you go to preview graphic output, you will typically get a four inch CGS at the pore strip and that will require additional rebar. The problem with this um, photograph 
well, there's nothing wrong with it technically. It's correct. The problem is in this pore strip, the PT stops here and starts here. So in this mid-span zone, you actually don't have any PT. So what you would have to do is figure out from the output the uh, unfactored slab moment. So let's go to sl slab four. You have a dead load moment. You have a live load moment. And that has to be factored and resisted by rebar because there is no PT in the system. That's the only secondary... Yeah, or the other thing you can do if you want to not do that by hand is in this span, forget stresses, just put zero PT there. Now, obviously, you're going to blow stresses, but this is a, a, a fictitious run. At this point, since you put in zero, go here, and that, that's the ultimate strength rebar you would need inside the pore strip that has, has to lap. So you can do it two ways. You can do a specialized run for this or do the regular run, run it through, and then just do a hand calc to put in the rebar in the bottom of the pore strip. But that's how you would model that system. So again, you're putting the tendon where it realistically is and accounting for the rebar as you need it. So hopefully that explained the pore strip issue. I just I hate doing runs with flags online. So I always put the 19 in and do it by hand. So having said that, that looks like that was my last question. Oh, no, I got two more. Um, no, last question was a thank you. You're very welcome. Hopefully it all worked out. I apologize for going a half hour longer, but it looks like everyone had a lot of questions and I'm happy to answer them. Um, and again, if you have any more questions, you want to email me or Dirk directly, we'll do our best to get back to you. Uh, buy the book, um, buy the software. Christmas is coming up and we need, we need the extra money. So we'd appreciate your uh, buying all of our stuff. With that, I'll turn it over to Ali, and I think that should probably cover it. Okay, thank you very much, Dirk Bundy and Brian Allred, for a very informative and interesting web seminar. I would also like to thank each and every one of the participants for joining us today. In a few minutes, you will receive an evaluation form by email from our office by which you can give us your feedback. We must take your input very seriously and try to shape our offerings based on what you need. So please help us do our best for you So by returning the evaluation form when you get them. With that, I am closing the seminar now. Thanks again and have a wonderful rest of the day.